the Dead and the Dying, written by Leon Hamilton, featuring Nightwatcher 666, Kyle Norris, Brady Bettis, Hunter Jordan, Creepy Face, Chillers and Thrillers, Paul J. McSorley, Olivia Steele, Jeff Sturdivant, and Melissa Medina. Prologue 2019 Nuevo Perizo, Ecuador A medical research team led by virologist Francine Gilbert and Bernard Holman of the CDC were investigating the report of a deadly viral outbreak. The report was from a local physician that traveled to a small village deep in the Amazon. His notes stated that the infection spread quickly and started with flu-like symptoms. It quickly became a high-grade fever and triggered a violent psychosis. Infected patients would have to be restrained to be treated. Despite the doctor's best efforts, the fever led to death in every case. His notes go on to state that he had made a mistake. The subjects he believed dead were waking up and attacking people. After narrowly escaping the village, Dr. Emil Suarez filed his report with the CDC, and vanished. After days of traveling on boat and on foot, the research team found the village. There was no one left. According to the information provided, there were 30 people in the village. The team located seven bodies. All of them had been stripped down to the bone. The rest of the villagers were nowhere to be found. Once all the samples were collected, Holman had his men follow blood trails found in different areas of the village. They were tasked with locating an infected survivor. Out of the four men that were sent, only one returned. He was badly injured and claimed he had been attacked by cannibals in the jungle. Gilbert, Holman, and the remaining members of the team left the village and returned to the United States. Three years later, A virus of unknown origin swept the globe. After quarantines and mass vaccinations, the virus mutated and continued to spread. Two years after that, outbreaks of the virus began to show up around the world. Act 1 Chapter 1. Overtime Silently smoking a cigarette and gripping the wheel, Jerry sped down the highway on his way home from work. In the distance, he could see an ocean of brake lights waiting for him. Just great. It had been a long day, and all he wanted was a beer, a blunt, and the remote for the TV. But traffic had other plans. Normally, this stretch of highway was smooth sailing. Tonight, it was a parking lot. As his car came to a stop, he let out a disgusted grunt and started trying to see what was causing the problem. In the distance, he could see police and emergency crews working to clear the wreck off of the road. Thinking it wouldn't be much longer, he relaxed in his seat and turned up the radio. Traffic crawled along for close to half an hour, till he was sitting next to an ambulance that had been on the scene. The EMTs were standing near the rear of the vehicle, closing the doors, and he got a quick glimpse inside. There was a person covered in a white sheet on the gurney. As the door shut, he could have sworn he'd seen the person move. Brushing it off, thinking he'd imagined it, he hit his cigarette and turned his attention back to the road. It took ten minutes to pass the wreck, and another 20 before he got home. The next morning, as he was drinking his first cup of coffee, he turned on the television to catch the weather. He sat through the usual barrage of bad news, high prices, strikes, and natural disasters. Then, just when he thought it was over, there was a breaking story. 
It was about the wreck he had seen the night before. A woman, who had apparently passed out behind the wheel, was involved in an accident. Her name was Francine Gilbert. She was pronounced dead at the scene, but somehow revived on the way to the hospital. According to the paramedics involved, the woman had to be restrained after waking up and violently attacking them. Of course, they blamed it on drugs and mental illness, but something about it made him uneasy. Maybe he'd seen too many movies, or maybe he was overthinking it, but to him, it felt wrong. The weekend flew by, and by Monday morning, he'd forgotten all about Francine and her miraculous recovery. After putting his uniform and staring at himself in the mirror for a second, he grumbled, Well, fuck my life. Then headed off to work. After everything he'd been through, he never thought he'd end up being a security guard. Every day was a monotonous, repetitive blur of bullshit and boredom. At this point, he spent the majority of his days praying for something to happen, but it never did. As the hour slid by, he watched the helicopters landing and taking off from the hospital across the road. They were busier than usual. Normally, he'd see two, maybe three helicopters a day, but there had been ten. The roads were busy as well. He'd been hearing sirens and seeing emergency crews scrambling throughout the day. Another odd thing he'd noticed was the amount of people walking along the road. His post was located in an isolated area. There were a few small subdivisions around. The complex he was working for actually sat on the edge of one. Still, it was rare to see anyone walking in this particular area. Other than his post and the hospital, there was nothing on this road besides a sewage processing station. Once again, he chalked it up to his imagination building a scenario to keep himself entertained. Around 5.30 p.m., Sergeant Phillips... A stout, older man with a shiny bald head and a bushy gray beard stopped by to do a post check and shoot the shit. When he was done with his checklist, he stepped out of the booth and nodded. All clear as usual. So there's good news and bad news. The good news is, you're doing a great job. The bad news is, your relief called in and I'm going to need you to do it for a little longer. I'm trying to get someone in right now, but... I'm not getting any responses. Shaking his head and letting out a sarcastic chuckle, Jerry patted his pockets, looking for his smokes. Once he held them, he got one lint and glanced up at the sky, noticing a wall of dark clouds rolling in. No response, huh? Sounds about right. Because you're not getting a response from me either. I'm not pulling a double. I still haven't gotten paid from the last time. So fuck off and find somebody else. The Sarge laughed and pulled his belt up. (laughs) Shit rolls downhill, son. And guess who's at the bottom of that hill? He paused (laughs) to look at Jerry, then started towards the golf cart. Look on the bright side. You get some OT. A little extra money never hurts. Knowing arguing wouldn't change anything, Jerry scowled and stepped in the booth, slamming the door behind him. Fuck this job. He grumbled before flopping down in his chair and pulling out his phone. Queuing up a good scary story on YouTube, he turned up the volume and started sketching to pass the time. It wasn't long before those dark clouds he'd seen blotted out the sun and thunder rumbled across the sky. Around 7 o'clock, as the sun began to set, the first few drops of rain fell. By the look of things, it was going to rain all night. And if his relief didn't show up, he'd be stuck doing patrols in it. As that thought crossed his mind, the alarm for his 7.30 patrol sounded. Tilting his head back and closing his eyes, he took a deep breath and muttered, They don't pay me enough for this shit. Getting up and grabbing his rain gear, he cursed and grumbled complaints to himself. Normally, this would be where he'd radio command and tell them he was starting his patrol. In his agitated state of mind, he slipped the radio in his pocket, grabbed his keys, and stormed out of the booth. 
The facility was huge. Each patrol covered 16 different checkpoints around the complex. By the end of the night, he would have covered 96 checkpoints in all, with the majority being outside. The first stop was Building E, a medium-sized tin building with a roll-up door. It was supposed to be used for storage, but at the moment housed the golf carts used by the facility's work crew. He just finished checking the doors when the rain came pouring down. Luckily, Building G was next and had cover and he'd be able to hold up there for a second. Hurrying over, he locked the doors from the receiving bay then scanned the marker and stood watching the rain. From where he was standing, he could see the sliding gate leading to the retention pond. There was also an area just beyond the trees that was used for testing. The company manufactured drilling equipment, and from time to time, they used the prototypes over there. It wasn't unusual to see animals back there. He'd seen deer, rabbits, possums, and a skunk, to name a few. But tonight, the moment he caught something out of the corner of his eye, he got nervous. At first glimpse, it was hard to make out. His initial thought was deer. When he focused on it, he saw a man wearing a gray t-shirt and tan shorts walking the path leading to the test area. Grabbing the radio, he watched the guy for a few seconds, then called it in. Patrol 1 to command, come back. There was a burst of static, then Phillips replied. Send it. I've got a situation at the east access gate. I've got a single male heading into the testing area. Please advise. Do not approach. I say again, do not approach. I'll call the authorities and file an incident report. Stay put, I'm heading your way. Copy that. Slipping the radio back into his pocket. Jerry watched the trespasser till he vanished behind the trees. After a few minutes, Sergeant Phillips arrived on the golf cart. Rather than stopping near Jerry, he rode over to the gate and checked the lock first. When he was done, he hopped back on the cart and rode over. The police are on their way. Were you able to get a good look at that guy? Shaking his head and pointing to the area he'd first spotted the man, Jerry described exactly what he had seen. Because of the distance and the rain, he hadn't seen much, but there was one detail that stuck out. The trespasser was limping. It didn't seem to be stopping him, but it was noticeable. Phillips mentioned the terrain back there being rough and thought the guy had probably turned an ankle. Not knowing the area well enough to argue, Jerry agreed to the possibility. But what the Sarge said next caught him by surprise. All right, go back to your station and switch all cameras to the perimeter. Stay in the booth. Armed personnel will be doing all the patrols tonight. If you have to use the shitter, go to Building J and keep your radio with you at all times. Seeing Phillips so wound up instantly made him alert. Normally Sarge was fairly laid back and rarely wore his pistol. Tonight, his forty-five was on his hip and he was looking concerned. What happened? Should I get my gun out of my car? Legally, I can't say yes to that. But if it happens to happen, I'll look the other way. There was an incident at the hospital. We're getting reports of a riot. Like a full-blown riot? Or just a bunch of people yelling and talking shit? This one's looking pretty real to me. Some kid got shot by the cops at the hospital. The details we're getting aren't making any sense. The boy was 14 and in critical condition before being shot by the police. The kid had been hit by an ATV a few days earlier. Like I said, the reports don't make any sense. All we know is, the kid got killed, and people are mad about it. So far things are escalating and unfortunately we're right across the road from it. As the Sarge finished talking, Officer Briggs from Guard Station 1 came over the radio. Tourist 1 to command, police have arrived and they're headed to your location. After clearing the call, Phillips sent Jerry back to his post. During the walk back, he stopped by his car and got his pistol out of the glove box. As he closed the door, a patrol car pulled up and let down his window. Jerry told him where to find the sergeant, 
then hurried back to the booth and opened the gate. Once he'd gotten out of his rain gear and put on a pot of coffee, he took a seat at the desk and started switching the cameras. The moment the rear gates came on screen, there was a problem. There's a bayou that runs behind the building, separating it from the residential neighborhood. Occasionally, people would jog the paths or walk their dogs back there, but it was considered a low traffic area. Tonight, there were three people standing near the fence. At first, they weren't moving. They were all sniffing the air and looking around till something caught their attention. As the group took off running, Jerry realized that they were headed straight for the Sarge. Grabbing the radio, he tried to warn them. You've got three people approaching from the rear of the property. Don't open the gate. No response. Quickly switching camera two to the east gate, he saw the police officer and Sarge with their weapons drawn. There was no sound of the feed, but he could tell they were yelling commands at the trespassers. Whatever they were saying, it wasn't working. Taking a good look at the people, Jerry realized one of them was a little girl. The other two, a man and a woman, were banging against the gate, but the girl was looking for a way in. Trying the radio again, he yelled, Watch the girl. She's headed for the access gate. Hearing the call, Phillips turned to see the girl as she squirmed and squeezed her way through the slight gap between the rolling gate and the fence. The moment she was inside, she ran at Sarge. Rather than shooting her, he stepped back as she charged. When she got too close, he kicked her in the chest, sending her sprawling backwards across the ground. The officer rushed over to get the girl under control, quickly overpowering her. He put her in a squad car, but not before taking several bites to his hands and arms. At this point, the other two made their way to the access gate, but all they could do was reach their arms through the gap. Mesmerized by what was unfolding on the screen, Jerry hadn't been paying attention to what was happening around him. A lone figure with a slight limp ran through the open field that sits on the right side of Jerry's post. He didn't see him until his hands were smacking against the glass. Nearly falling over in his seat, Jerry spun around and locked eyes with the teenage boy. Frantically pounding his palms against the window, he begged for help. Letting him in would be breaking the rules, but judging by the look of it, the kid was in danger. Hopping up from his seat, Jerry went to the door and hurried the boy inside. As the door slammed shut, the kid limped over to the window started looking in the direction he'd just come from. Without taking his eyes off of the window, he nervously muttered, They're trying to kill me. Who's trying to kill you? Jerry fired back while locking the door. I don't know. They just started chasing me. Relax. Nobody's getting in here. The police are already on site. Sit down, catch your breath, and tell me what happened. Doing as he was told, the boy took a seat and tried to get himself together. Once he'd calmed down a little, he explained. I was taking a shortcut through the bayou because it was raining. When I got to the trail, I saw those freaks huddled around something on the ground. As soon as they saw me standing there, they came after me, so I ran. I thought I'd lost them when I found that spot behind the trees, but they're here now. Please, man, you've got to help me. Getting a good look at the kid for the first time, Jerry noticed a bloody wound on his left calf. Calm down. What's your name? Aiden. Okay, Aiden. You're bleeding pretty bad. What happened to your leg? I don't know. I think that bitch tried to bite me. Everything was happening so fast I couldn't pay attention. She caught me by the water before I crossed the bayou. When I got there, she fucking tackled me and we fell in. She was clawing at me, trying to drown me. I just kept kicking till she let go. When I got to the other side, my leg was hurting, but I had to run because others were coming. Making a mental note of everything he just heard, Jerry grabbed his first aid kit and did his best to bandage the kid up. Once he was done, he turned his attention to the monitor and froze. 
Sarge and the police officer weren't on the camera. Grabbing the radio, he tried making contact, but got no response from Phillips or Briggs and GS1. Quickly switching cameras, he caught sight of the Sarge running to building E. The officer was on the ground near the generators, being attacked by the guy from the gate while the woman ran after Phillips. Trying not to panic, Jerry split the screen and brought up the feed from GS1. The booth was empty, and Briggs's car wasn't in the lot. That motherfucker. He mumbled to himself before glancing out the window at his own car. Thinking of making a run for it, he side-eyed Aiden and considered leaving him there while he had the chance. As that thought crossed his mind, the sight of three more police cars racing down the street made him smile. Thinking they were about to pull in the lot, he pressed the button to open the gate, then watched in shock as they sped by without stopping. No, 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 no! Where the fuck are they going? Grabbing the flashlight off of his desk and rushing out to the street, he tried to flag them down, but it was too late. Standing by the side of the road, the sound of gunfire in the distance made him pause. Between the thunder and the pouring rain, he could have been mistaken, but as it continued, there was no doubt. Something was happening. Jerry had seen enough and turned and headed straight for his car. As he crossed the driveway and stepped into the grass bordering the parking lot, Aiden, who was standing in the doorway of the guard shack, yelled, They're coming! Run! Four figures were racing towards him. There was no way he'd get to his car before they got to him. With no other option, Jerry darted for the shack, managing to slip inside and slam the door before they got to him. The shack was made of steel and concrete, with thick bulletproof glass and a heavy metal door. As long as that door was locked, there was no way anyone was getting in. Soaking wet, Jerry doubled over, gasping for air. Years of smoking and bad living had left him in shitty shape. After taking a moment to gather himself, he noticed Aiden was curled up in a ball, hiding under the desk. Standing up straight and wiping the water out of his eyes, Jerry could hear the dull thudding of them pounding against the glass. It was so thick that their fists barely made a sound. Since they couldn't get inside, it took a moment to get a good look at their faces. One was a young woman with short hair, wearing a Sonics uniform. There was a location near the freeway. He assumed she'd come from there. The right side of her face had been ripped away, exposing her skull and now empty eye sockets. Her arms were a mess of shredded flesh and splattered and smeared bits of skin and blood on the glass. Next to her was an older guy in a torn red flannel shirt. He was missing an arm and his intestines dangled from a gaping hole in his gut. He snarled and pressed his face against the glass, attempting to bite his own reflection. The third was a kid with dreadlocks. There was an open wound on his neck, still gushing blood, as he frantically clawed at the window. The last of them had already lost interest and was wandering towards the road. It was a woman. Since her back was turned, Jerry couldn't get a good look at her. Judging by the way she was moving, he guessed her legs had been badly damaged. What the fuck is going on? He muttered to no one in particular as he watched the Sonics girl get distracted by something to her right. Glancing in to see what grabbed her attention, Jerry's jaw dropped. The sliding gate was still open and Sergeant Phillips was on the golf cart being chased by the man and woman from the east gate. When he sped by, the ones that had been banging on the window joined the chase. He made it halfway across the parking lot before the kid with the dreads caught up and jumped on the cart. Trying to shake him off, Phillips made a hard left and hit a parking block. The impact caused the cart to tip over, landing on its side, sliding a few feet before coming to a stop. The kid was trapped under the cart still swiping at the Sarge as he crawled out and got to his feet. Pulling his sidearm and firing into the swarm, he ran. 
He dropped two of them, but they were getting up. If he could make it to the command center and get inside, he'd be safe. But that was still a ways to go, and they were right behind him. Luck was on his side. As fast as those things were, they weren't all that coordinated. The rain was making the pavement slick, causing a couple of them to slip and fall. Only one was still close to him when he made it to the door. The flannel guy had somehow stayed upright, even though he was dragging a train of his own intestines. Easily avoiding the one-armed attack, Sarge brought the gun up and put a bullet through his brain. The flannel guy dropped and went still, buying Sarge just enough time to scan his badge and get inside. Letting out a sigh of relief, Jerry flopped down in his chair and covered his eyes with his hands for a second. Once he'd gathered himself, he turned his attention to Aiden. They're gone. You can come out now. The kid didn't respond, so he leaned forward to get a better look. The boy's eyes were wide open, but he wasn't moving. Shit. Grabbing his pistol off of the desk, Jerry got up and headed for the door. The crowd was still at the command center. He could get to his car now. Taking one last look out of the window, making sure the coast was clear, he made a break for it. He was out of the door, across the lot, and in his car faster than he thought, but he wasn't alone. He hadn't seen the shredded corpse of the police officer shambling towards the passenger side of the car. His body was so damaged, he barely looked human. All the skin from his face and chest had been ripped away. His arms had been chewed down to the bone, and he'd been partially gutted. When he smacked against the window, Jerry nearly shit his pants. His first reaction was to grab the gun and fire, shattering the window and deafening himself in the process. Ears ringing and distorted, he fumbled for the keys for a second while the thing outside the window pounded on the side of the car. The commotion got the crowd's attention. As they ran and hobbled their way towards him, he managed to get his keys in the ignition. The cop who was now reaching into the car took a few messy swipes at Jerry, splattering clumps of bloody flesh everywhere as he cranked the engine. He wouldn't be able to pull the car and drive with the thing so close to him. Taking the gun out of his lap, he fired a second shot. This time, its head snapped back and it stopped moving. Throwing the car in drive, Jerry mashed the gas and sped out of the lot watching his pursuers vanish from sight in the rear view mirror. Chapter 2 Bad Neighbors Laying in bed, staring at the ceiling, Daniel listened to his neighbors fighting. He'd never met them, but after a year of this, he knew their names. Frank, the husband, was a bad drunk, or at least that's what Daniel thought. Frank would come home, yell at Anna, the wife, until she either stormed off and slammed the door, or fought back. Tonight was different. Someone crossed the line and things had gotten violent. At first, they were just yelling, then came a loud smack. Daniel couldn't tell who hit who, but the arguing stopped and the sounds of a scuffle started. It didn't last long. There was a heavy thud and everything got quiet. He could hear a slight thumping sound, mixed with a sort of muffled grunting that lasted a minute or two then. Nothing. No screaming. No arguing. No movement at all. It was as if they both dropped at the same time. Sitting up and grabbing his phone, Daniel paused when he heard the sound of footsteps, followed by the slam of the front door. Phone in hand, he slipped out of bed and went to his front door to sneak a peek through the peephole. The dim hallway lights gave his view an eerie feel, but there was no one there. He'd missed whoever it had been, but it didn't matter. Judging by what he'd heard, 
someone was hurt and possibly dead. Dialing 911, he called for help and tried to go back to bed. It wasn't long before he heard a sound coming from next door. The police hadn't arrived yet, so he knew it wasn't them, but there was no denying someone was moving around. At first, there was a slow groaning sound, then an explosion of noise as whoever it was started thrashing the place. When the police finally arrived, things got worse. After pounding on the door shouting, Sheriff's Department, they kicked it open and started yelling for the person to get on the ground. One of the officers yelled, Taser deployed. Then everything went crazy. It took a moment for Daniel to realize the cops were the ones screaming for help. Officer down! A distressed voice called out, seconds before shots were fired. Falling out of bed and crawling across the floor, Daniel hurried to the restroom and took cover in the bathtub. More shots rang out from the hallway, followed by screaming, then quiet. An unfamiliar sound drifted in after a few seconds. A muffled, wet smacking mixed with an almost animalistic growl could be heard. The combination sent an odd sensation of confusion and fear through Daniel as he lay there listening. It almost sounded like someone was eating. The more he focused on it, he was almost certain that's what it was. Sirens approaching cut through the noise, followed by the sound of the person in the hall taking off running. He couldn't tell which direction they had gone, but it didn't matter. As long as they weren't at his front door, he felt safe enough to get out of the tub. Stepping out of the restroom, he could hear police in the parking lot barking orders through their PA system. Curiosity got the best of him. Quickly moving to his bedroom window, he peeped through the curtains to get a look. He could see the squad cars and officers, but he couldn't see who they were talking to. After a few seconds, a figure rushed in and the police started shooting. They pumped him full of rounds, but he wouldn't go down. He ran straight at them and managed to grab one of the officers. That's when Daniel saw him. It was Frank. He'd been shot at least a dozen times, and he had a knife sticking out of his neck, but he was still moving. He was tearing into the cop he tackled, he was taking bites out of his face and neck. What the fuck? Daniel muttered just before a dull thud from his front door nearly scared him to death. Turning to face the noise, the smell of blood and gunpowder wafted in. A second thud reverberated through the room. There was a force behind this one. The impact caused a picture to fall off of the wall and sent whoever was on the other side of the door into a frenzy. They snarled and banged against it, sounding more like a wild animal than a human being. Lost somewhere between panic and shock, Daniel stood silently staring at the door. Mouth dry, heart pounding, his mind raced to the conclusion he needed a weapon. The only thing he had was an old aluminum bat he kept next to the bed. Keeping his eyes glued to the entrance, he moved slowly, trying not to make any noise. About halfway across the room, the pounding at the door stopped, and so did he. Shouting and sirens from the parking lot turned to white noise. In his mind, whoever was in that hall was about to come crashing in at any second. Taking a deep breath and holding it, he darted for the bat, grabbed it, and turned to swing. But nothing happened. After a long moment of silence, he exhaled slowly and quietly made his way to the front door and stopped. There was a pool of blood on the floor that was coming from the hall. Doing his best to avoid it, he nervously stepped up and took a look through the peephole. Other than a body on the ground, the hall was empty. He couldn't see exactly what was wrong with the person, but... It was a lot of blood. 
More gunfire from the parking lot made him jump and back away. Whatever was happening, he wanted no part of it. Staring at the growing pool on his floor, he frowned, then headed to grab some towels to soak up the mess. After using nearly all of his towels, he flopped down on his sofa, listening to the chaos outside. The police were everywhere. He thought it would be all over soon, but it wasn't. Hours passed. There were two more shootouts, the last one being right outside his door. When it was all said and done, five bodies were removed from the scene by men in hazmat suits. Less than an hour later, the entire complex was quarantined. As soon as the announcement was made, everyone, including Daniel, stepped out of their homes and started asking questions. As the crowd gathered, he stepped back to get out of the way and wound up standing off to the side. It didn't take long for things to get out of control. People refused to be prisoners in their own homes. One lady attempted to get in her car to drive away and was arrested on the spot. That was the tipping point. Some kid in the back of the crowd threw a bottle at the cops and everyone went nuts. Backing away from the surging crowd, he glanced to his left and saw a girl with her cell phone out, live streaming the chaos. He watched her for a moment before someone went sprinting by screaming for help. The girl with the phone turned to film him and was blindsided by what looked like a homeless woman. The impact was brutal. When they hit the ground, the bag lady started attacking the girl, snarling and screaming. The bag lady mounted the girl, pinning her down. She unleashed a flurry of punches and attempted to bite the girl before someone stopped her. A couple of guys that had been standing nearby grabbed the bag lady and pulled her away. During the struggle, she bit one of them. The guy let go and she attacked the second man. He'd seen enough. Daniel ran full speed back to his apartment and locked the door. Chapter 3 Groceries The alarm clock on Sydney's nightstand blared to life as it did every morning. And just like every morning before, she groaned then turned it off and got up. Dragging her feet across the carpet, she went to the kitchen and put on a pot of coffee. Once it was ready, she poured herself a cup and headed to the backyard to get some air. As she opened the patio door, noise flooded in, sirens in the distance, and the voices of her neighbors caught her by surprise. Typically, it was dead quiet at this time of the morning. Now, it seemed like the whole neighborhood was up and in a hurry. From where she was standing, she could hear a neighbor, Roy, going to his tool shed. Stepping out and flagging him down, she got his attention. Hey, Roy, what's going on? Why is everybody getting up so early? With a slightly frazzled look, he shook his head. Oh, hey, Sid. Something happened at the hospital. People are going crazy all over the city. A bunch of us are going to the stores early to stock up in case things get bad. You should come. There's no telling how long this might last. Nodding and taking a sip of her coffee, Sid watched Roy grab a couple of five-gallon gas cans from the shed. As he walked off, she couldn't help but notice the 9 millimeter holster on his right hip. I think I'll sit this one out. You guys be careful out there. Call me if you need anything. She said, before taking another sip. Loading the cans in the trunk of his car, he paused to look at the house, then at her. Andrew didn't want to come with us. Could you keep an eye out for him? We shouldn't be gone long. She told him she would. He thanked her, then quickly got into the car with his wife, Beth, and drove away. Andrew, their son, was 16. Sydney didn't know much about the kid. She rarely saw him outside. When she did, it was in passing. From what she could see, he seemed like any other teenage boy. 
Shrugging off the strangeness of the situation, she watched as they joined in the small convoy headed for the highway. She felt like they were overreacting. It would probably blow over in a couple of days, and they'd be stung with a bunch of extra shit. Laughing to herself, she went inside and went on with her morning. Two hours later, Roy and his wife pulled into the driveway in a hurry. They immediately started hustling their bags into the house, while Beth kept nervously looking around. When they were done, the two of them, carrying two bags apiece, hurried over and knocked on Sydney's door. The moment she opened up, Roy handed his bags to her, then took Beth's and sat them just inside the door. As he set the bags down, Sid noticed a bandage on his right forearm. Thanks. Is everything okay? What happened to your arm? Glancing down at the bandage, Roy started to say something, but Beth nudged him to speed things up. It's not important. Lock your doors and stay inside. Do you have a gun? Shocked by the question and confused by how they were acting, Sid shook her head no. Showing her his hands, Roy reached behind his back and pulled a revolver from his waistband, then handed it over. There's a box of bullets in one of those bags. Have you ever used a gun before? The weight of the pistol in her hand somehow snapped her back to reality. There's bullets in the bag? Why are you giving me a gun? What the fuck is going on? Hesitantly, he shrugged. We don't know. We were at Costco checking out. The next thing I know, people are running and screaming. When we got to the parking lot, things got worse. While we were loading the car, some kid attacked me. Everything happened so fast, I didn't see him till he bit me. I closed the trunk and he was just there, on me, sinking his teeth into my arm. He was so small, he couldn't have been older than eight or nine. When I snatched my arm away, he fell and I got in the car. Beth cranked the engine when I got in, but by then there was a crowd running towards us. I've never seen anything like that. They chased us till we got back on the highway. That's all we know. I gave you the gun because we saw stuff happening all over the neighborhood on our way in. So I'm going to ask you this again. Do you know how to use a gun? Staring at the pistol in her hand, Sid silently nodded her head. Good, Roy said before stepping back. If you need anything, call us. With that, he and Beth hurried off back to their place. As they passed their car, Sid noticed the side mirror had been broken and there were bloody smudges on the windows. For a moment, her mind went blank. She stood in the doorway, gun in hand, staring at the car till a blue Ford pickup came speeding past her house. She didn't recognize the driver, but she knew the truck. It belonged to Mr. Henry at the end of the block. He was a thin, old man with long hair and a bushy beard. The person driving was a woman, and there was a kid in the passenger seat. As they sped by, a group of people ran behind the truck. Caught up in the shock of the moment, Sid watched right up until one of them spotted her. A chubby kid with bright red hair, wearing a white Rick and Morty t-shirt, instantly changed course and ran straight at her. Snapping out of her daze, Sid shut the door, locked it and stepped back just before the kid came crashing through it. Screaming and blindly firing a shot in the kid's direction, she turned and ran for the back door. As she darted across the living room, he caught her. The weight of him jumping on her back drove her face first into the tile floor. The impact broke her nose and knocked out her front teeth before the boy started pounding on the back of her skull with his fists. Flashes of white light exploded in her vision every time he hit her. She felt every blow till he bit into her. All she could do was scream through a mouthful of blood and broken teeth as her world finally faded to black. Hey everyone. 
thank you so much for listening this was an absolute blast to put together for you guys i hope you guys enjoyed it uh, all the time and effort that went into it huge huge thank you to all the other voice actors for lending me their wonderful voices to make this thing possible because without them you know i i couldn't voice all these characters on my own um truly truly appreciative of them giving me you know their time and talent um and this is only part one of this series it'll be a four-part series it's essentially a i guess if you want to call it an audiobook kind of maybe a short novella if that's the proper terminology i guess um but it's a lot for me it's actually the longest story that i will have ever posted to the channel uh it takes a lot of time for me to narrate and then you know produce with all the sound effects and music and everyone's voices editing all that together so all i ask is you guys be patient with me i'll try to get the next part out as soon as possible i'm trying to do it at least no longer than a week gap in between that way you guys you know don't get disinterested and you know stay engaged with the story because leon hamilton the author did do a fantastic job writing the story and from what i understand he's been trying to get it you know produced and out for a while but unfortunately he just couldn't find the proper person to be able to do that for him well he offered it to me and i graciously took it upon myself to make it happen and get all these other wonderful voice actors involved uh, to make you know something great for you guys and a great uh, piece of content for my channel that I hope you guys will all come to love and enjoy. Uh, but stay tuned for part two, chapters four through six of Act One. Uh, and that's all I'll say on that. Thank you guys. Have a good night.